Okay, so welcome back and um, we're on to the final panel of the conference and the final session of the conference. Um, and I'm very grateful for everybody's participating. Um, I wanted to advertise before we start the panel that we're going to do basically the same thing next year, but hopefully in person and of course in Paris. And we always plan to follow this conference with a workshop and maybe we'll actually get to do that next time. So please keep this on your calendars. I'm laying out a marker and uh, I would like to have everybody come join us. And then we can go and drink beer or whatever, drink wine after the event. Anyway, so now we have the panel, um, which um, I'm moderating and I will also make some remarks. Um, but in particular, the uh, new member of the sort of discussion is Julian Sonner. So I want to give him first place in the discussion. So I'm going to stop sharing and ask him to share and make his remarks. Uh, I will try to share now. All right, and now I will go to full screen. Um, is that all right? Yeah, looks good. Okay. So um, thanks very much for inviting me to, to join this panel. Thanks very much also for putting on this conference, um, which, uh, well, the one advantage of these Zoom conferences that although I was busy during the day, I was able to follow many of the talks uh, later on YouTube. Um, mostly on twice speed. So if, if I have any misunderstandings, maybe that's why. But I, I decided, so this panel, and I understand it is uh, probably mostly uh, going to be about scrambling chaos and issues related to that. But I will not really focus on that very much. Um, I might have some remarks on it. But what I want to talk about is a little bit um, the relation of microstructure or microscopics and the ensemble. And so um, the uh, role of ensembles in some sense have been coming up uh, recently and not so recently um, in discussions of black holes. So for example, in discussions of information loss, um, often these discussions revolve precisely around this relation between uh, some kind of ensemble. So for example, one might say the canonical ensemble uh, in, in a thermal ensemble sense, uh, versus expectations from microscopics. And as in this conference, uh, this is generically referred to as, as microstructure. So um, I try to advertise here that the, the common thread, um, which is particularly sharp in this context of ADS-CFT, because most of the time we have some very clearly defined dual system. So the common thread is um, whether the observed ensemble is actually a fundamental property of gravity or whether it's an effective notion. So for example, even in this information loss discussion, you know, the question is whether um, what happens is an evolution that makes the system only look to some effective sense uh, thermal or whether really the final state is, is properly thermal, like really a density matrix. Um, and um, the recent discussions uh, about ensemble in a different sense, namely sort of in the random Hamiltonian or random matrix sense. Also here, the question is whether things only look effectively like, let's say a random matrix or whether the ensemble, the notion of ensemble in gravity really is a fundamental property of gravity. So uh, in a little bit more detail, of course, I will try to keep my remarks short as was requested. So um, the first example again is the one where I'm talking about thermality, perceived thermality. And a nice context to discuss this is the celebrated eigenstate thermalization hypothesis or the eigenstate thermalization approach to quantum thermalization. And this of course says that individual uh, microstates do actually encode the ensemble. However, not exactly, they do so up to exponential corrections. So the way that this is typically stated is that um, if you look at the one point function of um, a typical operator, uh, in energy eigenstates, then on the diagonal, I even failed to write the, the delta, Kronecker delta here. This looks exactly like the microcanonical thermal answer, but there are off diagonal corrections, fluctuation corrections, Rij, uh, which are um, random numbers. There is some dependence which I'm on the, on the energy and the difference on energies, which I'm suppressing here, but they are suppressed by a power of the microcanonical entropy here, e to the minus s over two. And so what this is saying in our holographic language is that probing individual microstates gives universal answers, which are very close to the black hole answers. So here I showed the one point function, 
But of course, it is also extremely interesting to think about how to extend this to more than one point functions. So of course, in two point functions, we're talking already about the fluctuations, but, and this is the one remark that I will make um, in parallel that you know relates to the scrambling uh, topic here. You can also ask, for example, what happens to um, things like four point functions in particular out of time order four point functions or even higher point functions. Um, and also there, there is, uh, um, mounting evidence that at least to some degree of approximation in these eigenstates which satisfy ETH, you also recover um, notions uh, um, in, 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 in microstates that are close to the ensemble average. And the question, of course, is one that was discussed a lot in this conference is in, how, in what sense do the microstates or in what sense does the microstructure really look like the ensemble? So here again, just advertising ETH as one of the um, as one of the frameworks to think about this. And so exponentially small corrections are here, okay, to distinguish in some sense the ensemble and the, the actually true thermal state. And so they also are here to rescue unitarity from this perspective. So then um, recently, for example, it was um, proposed by various people and being extremely sparse up to I'm saying nothing about references here, but for example, by the group at UBC, also by people like, the Boer and Belin and uh, also myself and Franz Janayak involved, that somehow the bulk low energy gravity only sees some hard average over energy windows, which is in the spirit of this ETH. Okay, and so we, we have um, access to the ensemble, approximate ensemble via ideas of it being encoded in the structure, microstructure of the states. But the second example, perhaps um, a little less familiar is um, where quantum chaos basically tells us something that, um, well, maybe superficially is similar. So an individual quantum uh, a a chaotic theory encodes the um, ensemble in the sense now of random Hamiltonians up to exponential correction. So for example, we can compute um, the, in some, in some um, sense, the connected correlation between two energy eigenvalues, so between the density of energy eigenvalues rho of E and rho of E primed. And um, what we see is that there is a non-zero connected contribution. So something that's diagonal, which we call the Euclidean wormholes nowadays, plus there are other corrections. Um, I, I will tell, say a little bit more why this, why I'm calling this off diagonal here. Um, and, um, well, the sum of this should be zero because there should be no connected uh, contribution to the spectral two-point function in one individual theory. But there is some sense in which this uh, connected contribution here is a good approximation to some extent. So I think that uh, Stephen Schenker talked about this at this conference in um, this very nice work, which talks about um, an explicit version of this uh, in a toy model of SYK. So um, I want to basically advertise here that these ideas are basically um, a consequence of thinking about the effective description of chaotic theories after they have become what is called quantum ergodic. And this can be done by looking at uh, operator correlations by using a symmetry breaking principle, which uh, we have dubbed causal symmetry breaking. And what is nice about this causal symmetry breaking is that it's really like an effective field theory description of these RMT type correlations even for individual systems. And it can be developed in a topological expansion a la matrix model as was done by SSS, Sart, uh, Stanford and Schenker. Um, but it can be done for general quantum chaotic systems. Now, I'm, I just want to say, after I'm trying to be brief here and maybe a little bit provocative, we of course haven't done this for n equals to four super young ones. But the fact that this is an EFT that only relies on symmetry breaking, at least uh, makes it very attractive to claim that you know, this can be established for a generic quantum chaotic system. So this gives some notion of the ensemble um, just because of chaotic dynamics. So um, what do I mean by this? So maybe this um, last slide here will make some um, more specific uh, connections to uh, points of discussion in the conference. So um, what we're sort of saying here is that there is underlying um, unitary uh, but chaotic dynamics, but the semi-classical gravity in some sense only has access to uh, a coarse grained version of this. However, what is um, astonishing is that it still seems to be able to bootstrap this coarse grained data into insights about the microstructure. 
So in particular, things like spectral rigidity, so universal properties about the spectrum of eigenvalues is encoded in this coarse grained data. And this uh, revelation was what really has led to this very nice progress, for example, on the page curve, it has to led to um, you know, new evaluations, understandings of this factorization puzzle, meaning the um, occurrence of, of Euclidean wormholes in ADS-CFT and many other beautiful topics. But perhaps um, from the quantum chaos perspective, this is not quite so unreasonable. And this is the point that I wanted to make is because um, it is known uh, in uh, quantum chaotic theories that you can actually understand this idea of spectral rigidity. So the, the repulsion of eigenvalues, something about the very small microstructure of eigenvalues by actually expanding the spectral density in essentially semi-classical contributions, these so-called per periodic orbit expansions due to Goodsweller. So one uses basically properties uh, of the classical chaotic dynamics of the system to describe in a semi-classical classical expansion the spectrum and therefore also the spectral correlations. And this is the sense, um, the, these periodic orbit expansions take this form where you typically have some diagonal berry tabor contribution, which gives uh, the spectral rigidity and then it gives these off diagonal contributions in which there is some interference between uh, these semi-classical orbits and they give you um, corrections to this leading diagonal answer. And as uh, Steve, I think, has also already indicated in his talk, there is some sense in which the average notion here on the diagonal is the wormhole, and those uh, uh, off-diagonal contributions in this periodic sense are there to restore the spectralization problem, because after all, we do know that the whole thing comes from a manifestly unitary factorizing contribution. So um, I, I think I'll um, stop with this. Basically, there is a well-defined topological expansion for individual generic um, quantum chaotic theories in the ergodic limit. I wanted to sort of make the moral parallel between ETH and these RMT ensembles. Um, and the questions that this raises is specializing to ADS-CFT, is there a bulk semi-classical analog of the Goodsfella formula? So what are the analogs of these periodic orbits, particularly in high dimensional bulk gravity? And also more personally from my approach to this, one can also ask what is the bulk manifestation of this symmetry breaking principle, which of course I didn't have time to explain, but I'm just putting it out there. So thanks very much. And I think I'll pass on to the other panelists. Thank you very much. Um, that's great. So uh, following the sort of general format of these things, uh, can you stop sharing? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the, um, uh, we'll have all the panelists present and then we'll just throw it out to questions. So I'm gonna say a couple of remarks and then it'll be followed by Sean and um, then, uh, the plan is that uh, it uh, we, we have uh, um, Ben wrap up. So I'm just going to pick up on a couple of the threads that were in my talk. Are you seeing that properly, I hope? No, there's again this build effects. Oh, thing let's stop this stupid thing. Okay, let's try again. That's, that looks better, I hope. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Okay, so basically, I just wanted to pick up on this, on this couple of threads in my talk and just, you know, raise them for further discussion. Um, you know, the one thing we need to do in this whole super strong program is to find the E to the S states. We're very, very, com we, we have ideas about how to find them, but to actually construct them and scatter into them is another huge issue that we need to solve. <clears throat> but um, the practical issue that's important to us is can we see elements of the scrambling process within the microstate geometries and superstrata? And that means you have to, in terms of the CFT, you have to access the twisted sector states. And that's actually possible. As I tried to emphasize, superstrata, while they only access a small fraction of those states, they really do access some of them because the gap, the energy gap, of the superstrata really is the gap of the, of the twisted sector. And so it might be that you can actually get information about how things scramble into excitations to get some part of the picture of the scrambling process for and into black holes and get it from the microstate geometries alone. And in particular, that's why one of the things I found sort of the work that I was doing with Emil and then the subsequent work by Nate and uh, Sean and Rishwan very interesting, this whole idea that you can get tidal trapping. And it's this very, very nice combination of the sort of semi, the, sorry, the classical 
picture that comes from superstrata and from microstate geometries, and then using it as a tool to look at a string theory calculation, which then leads you to some really nice, interesting new physics about the fact that the tidal forces get large, the string excites, and gets trapped in the bottom of microstate geometry. And it runs again emphasizes something we've used a few times in string theory, but it's, I think it's possibly coming back. I mean, there's, a, there's um, uh, is this whole idea of using Penrose limits. And in particular, one of the things that it gave us is that we, we did this calculation in classical supergravity. We looked at the scalar scattering of microstate geometries. We saw the BTC <coughs> features that Benzo has now really computed the hell out of. But the important thing is, from my perspective, is that once you put the string corrections in, all the echoes go away. So what you see is that even these very simple, super symmetric, smooth microstate geometries exhibit complete absorption of matter. And so one of the other things I'd really like to, when I first sort of started thinking about how to things might get trapped, I thought we're gonna to have to deal with back reaction. We're gonna to have to see how the background geometry robs energy from the incoming probe. But it turns out you don't have to. It's because of the ultra relativistic uh, acceleration of the probe. The probe itself becomes stringy and gets, becomes massive and falls back. But at the same time, we will have to address this issue of how does the back reaction occur? How do you take a stringy excitation and look at how it dissolves into the excitations of the, um, of the CFT? And that's why you know, I think the, the sort of calculations we've seen from and Sean's talk and so forth are extremely, and Ben's as well, are extremely important uh, to understand this picture. Um, in addition, this is something actually Daniel started asking about, and I, th I think it's also very important. There's the issue of echoes. It's something that a lot of people have written about in our field and so forth, but really the only echoes you see, which I think are important, are these very, very low mass or very and highly red shifted fragments or you know, string excitations that break off this highly excited state. And there's an interesting question about whether they even get out because they're still gonna hit the tidal forces, they're still gonna get ex more excited. Maybe they get out, maybe they don't. But there's a probably, possibly an, an interesting guesstimate of what fraction of the energy comes out compared to the fraction that goes in. I think it's gonna be very, very small. And the other question is, well, is it mainly gravitons or is it going to be something else? Um, I, you know, if, if they're simply the master sector of super string theory, it's gonna be the standard model. And maybe it's a very weak jet, maybe it's not so weak, but I think there's an interesting calculation that might be within reach along those lines. I jokingly called it a homework problem, but I think it's some guesstimate could be possible. There's also, I think another interesting hybrid of classical and stringy calculation that can be done. It comes from these evanescent ergo surfaces, which Andrea and uh, Eperon, Real and Santos and Ben Michel and uh, who am I forgetting, uh, uh, Don Maroff, um, basically argue well, should be sites of scrambling. I would add to that this lump that we find at the bottom, near the bottom throat that transitions from BTC to the cap, where the momentum wave lurks as also a very likely scrambling locus. And if you looked at circular or trapped orbits in the vicinity of these things, you could probably analyze scrambling of particles into strings and perhaps get estimates of scrambling times and rates. And the interesting questions about what those scrambling times and rates are and how they're influenced by the huge rear shift between the top and bottom. But I think there's a stringy calculation or hybrid string classical calculation that be done that might tell us some more interesting physics of the process of scrambling. And I know a bunch of the postdocs at Saclay are really interested in doing this calculation. So, and then once again, the question for me is, you know, how does this enter into excitations of the background? How do you sort of bring this, this, this stringy calculation back into the semi-classical or into the classical excitations? Um, I'll come back to that later as I was trying to anticipate uh, what might come up um, later in the discussion. So I have one extra slide. So let me leave it at that and hand over to Sean. Sean, are you, you might be muted. Oh. Is he there? I Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> Good, okay, you got me wired from it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Good okay. Um, 
Let's share my screen. All right, uh, so I have one slide. <laughs> um, can every, oh, did I share yeah, this? Share it, you haven't oh. shared it yet. Sorry. Okay, um, share screen, share. Okay, can everybody see? Um, okay, can everybody see and hear and see the yes. mouse? Okay. Perfect, thank you. Um, Thanks, Nick. Uh, thanks, everyone, again, uh, to, for allowing me to just speak again. I have uh, just one slide, and I won't be long, but um, <clears throat> just uh, so it's in relations to uh, uh, some of the things Nick was saying and some of the things that we've been talking about in this conference um, in terms of, like, you know, title excitations and scrambling and, um, and back reaction and how to address those problems. Um, and so I... Um, so my, my perspective, a lot of the things I've worked on is in the D1, D5 CFT. And um, I think uh, it may be a nice place to at least person speak. Uh, gain uh, some of the information about this. Um, so uh, I, I talked about this a little bit previously uh, in my talk, but uh, so Superstrat have been shown to tidally excite probes in the, into the geometry. And there's a nice uh, dictionary between uh, the supergravity and the D1, D5 CFT. And these are uh, the, the, the names you see here are, are various works uh, involved in this and in, in different corners of this. Um, and so you can, uh, uh, because of this, you can deform, you can essentially study some dynamics by deforming the CFT with a deformation operator. And this allows you to, to compute certain uh, transition amplitudes which correspond to, uh, for example, maybe um, a probe being excited. Um, and that's, exact, that's actually the calculation that um, we, me and Ben looked at. Um, but the, the, the idea of this uh, uh, interaction is just, uh, it's composed of two things. It's this, uh, it's, it's D here. It's just the combination of this, uh, these supercharges because this is uh, actually a super performal field theory. Oh, sorry. And, um, and, and, a, and a sigma operator, which is this, what this does is it twists and untwists the effective strings uh, defined in the D1, D5 CFT. And so um, using this, you can study uh, a variety of, I, I think a variety of, of, of questions. Now, the caveat is that the, you, you can really, um, you can do this practically at a perturbative level in the deformation um, and one thing I've been trying to think about, Ben's been thinking about, several people maybe have been thinking about, is how to sort of uh, try to understand, you know, this um, in some type of strong coupling thing or region. Um, but it seems, uh, at least right now, I'm not quite sure how to do that. But at least at the perturbative level, um, you can compute various transitions. And so some of the future problems that uh that i would like to to look at and you know maybe others are interested is um uh, is for example the back reaction of the probe in the super strategy geometry you, so so basically the the idea is that you pick a you pick a final state that you want to study and you start with some initial state and then you compute the transition um and so the idea is you know depending on what you want to study you can put that final state in. For example, if you want to study the back reaction of the probe, you could allow in the final state, you could allow the probe to actually carry away some of the, 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 the momentum of the superstrata. Or as uh, Nick was talking in his yesterday, they, they have these new solutions. Um, what, what happens when you collide a superstrata with an anti-superstrata? So you can construct such an initial state in the CFT, and then you could apply uh, this interaction and you can pick a final state. Okay, maybe the question is what's the final state? And that's, um, I don't, you know, that, that may be hard to sort of see what it should be, but you could begin to sort of compute different transitions, but at least you could start off with a super strata, anti super strata and, and compute some final state. Or you, uh, an interesting uh, question that was also brought up was this zero, what happens when A, the A parameter goes to zero so I could imagine that you could compute some transition um, where the where of course you had some initial uh, uh, um, momentum along the S3 in the ground state, and which is what that's what corresponds to the momentum and the the angular momentum in the superstrata 
is the uh, is the Ramon ground states. You could conceivably compute a transition to some final state which has no angular momentum, but it's been carried off by probably some type of fermionic excitation. Um, and you know, I don't know if this would give any insight as to what what uh, the dual may be or um, what would be allowed or um, if it, it, we don't, I guess the, the idea in string theory is that it doesn't just run away and in, in, into a black hole solution because something stringy probably comes in, but I don't know, maybe this could give some insight into like what the final state could be. Uh, um, so you could also, uh, another thing is to actually look at the long winding sector. The sector that we looked at was with the uh, singly wound strings because it's much easier to compute these amplitudes in that case. But um, I think in, in the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a long winding sector in which the stringy states are actually um, sort of um, properly identified and not just sort of approximately. Um, and, you know, maybe it's possible to study the emission uh, of uh, the microstrata from the CFT perspective. Like um, basically you have an ADS3, uh, uh, so the, the ADS3 goes down into an ADS2 two cross S1 throat, but you could essentially just, you, you cut that region out and replace it by the CFT. And maybe then you couple the ADS3 region to flat space. I don't know, maybe you can compute some type of uh, emission similar uh, to, I think uh, Samir and, and company computed uh, something similar to this um, that, that, that I think corresponded maybe to the j March solution, but I, I won't say much more about that. Um, and also um, as, uh, Samir was asking Ben earlier, um, they've been computing um, out of time order correlators and it might be interesting to see like how these computations are related because it seems like there are some, some type of overlap or, or uh, similar types of terms that you see, you know, secular terms, T squared, um, uh, something like that. But um, yeah, so that's about all I have, just this one slide. I, I mean, I don't know if, if these things can actually really be done, um, this is just this is just uh, just thinking, you know, just throwing out ideas and seeing, you know, what people think. So um, that's all I have. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That was very good. I mean, that's the purpose of this exercise is to sort of try and stimulate further thought and discussion. If you can unshare, and uh, I'll ask Ben to sort of round out the discussion, then we'll throw it open to all comers. Okay. Can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, thanks. So I have two slides. Uh, there's two uh, things I want to touch upon. The first is related to um, my talk from earlier today. Um, so where I discussed the out of time order correlator in extremal BTZ and microstate geometries. And so um, just to Summarize very briefly what um, we find is um, that the iconal phase that determines the OTOC as a function of the time separation between the two pairs of operators exhibits some power law average growth and superposed on that some sawtooth uh, pattern, um, well, which I discussed before. And um, the point I want to emphasize here is that. Um, when you do the same computation for the uh, one zero n superstrata, um, then usually one finds that the OTOC behaves in exactly the same way. And by usually, I mean, unless the left moving temperature, which is the only non zero one, um, which corresponds to the square root of, uh, of the parameter n of the one zero n superstrata, uh, unless that temperature is, uh, is huge. Um, I have some formulas in a backup slide in case people are interested. But um, so this raises the question, okay, should we look at this uh, very special uh, superstrata with uh, extremely large uh, left moving temperature? Or is the conclusion that um, the OTOC is not powerful enough to resolve the difference between these um, microstate geometries and the, uh, the black hole? Um, should we use um, other probes of chaos? Um, 
um, late time uh, probes uh, of the type that uh, Julian was discussing, for instance. So that's one set of questions I'm wondering about. Then the second, um, okay, let me see, okay. The second point I wanted to bring up and uh, by coincidence, uh, Massimo Bianchi was uh, asking uh, a closely related question uh, during my talk. Um, is how these discussions of uh, OTOCs uh, in superstrata are related to the uh, discussions that also came up in this series of conferences um, of the result by Bianchi Grillo, um, Grillo Morales on uh, Lyapunov exponents that quantify the instability of the photon sphere of black holes. And uh, for black holes it's asymptotically flat space, uh, the instability has been related to quasi normal mode decay. And according to uh, Massimo and friends, uh, fuzzballs have smaller such a point of exponents than the corresponding black holes. So these uh, would be things that uh, do seem to discriminate between the microstates and the black holes. So the question I have is whether, and if so, how, these Lyapunov exponents uh, relate to those that uh, potentially appear in OTOCs. Uh, because at least as far as I understand, it's for the OTOCs that bounds of chaos have been uh, proposed for the thermal ensemble and for more general ensembles. And at first sight, um, at least to me, the physics uh, between these two notions looks quite different. Uh, on the one hand, there's quasi-normal mode uh, decay. On the other hand, um, the OTOC describes gravitational scattering very close to, to a horizon. So my question would be, is there a relation between these two notions? Um, and if so, how is the behavior of the OTOC that we've seen for extreme OBTC, for instance, and for superstrata uh, reflected um, in the Lyapunov uh, behavior? found for these uh, photospheres. So that's all I have, uh, thank you. Thank you indeed. So shall we throw it open for general discussion? Can you do the sort of usual raise your hands if you don't want to ask questions, make a point? Please well, I have a question ahead. for Ben actually, if I may just a clarifying question. Go ahead. The, the first slide, could, did you mind uh, putting it up one more time? Okay, I'll try. So uh, can, can you say a little bit more about that first point? Because uh, just uh, the, the, this. Right, so that's the, the first point about uh, unless the left room temperature mm -hmm. is huge. Mm -hmm. or... mm -hmm. Okay, that was my backup slide. So people were asking questions oh. that I didn't have the formulas handy before. So, um, okay, so yeah, let, let me say a little bit about the formulas here. So this is this relation between the, the radius of the corresponding to the throat and the radius corresponding to the cap. So I think Josef was uh, mentioning this in words during the talk. And we restrict in this plot to the minimal value of J, which is uh, one half. Um, then here is the scrambling time. So the one third comes from the cubic uh, uh, growth that, uh, of, the, um, of the iconal phase. Um, and the relevant things are um, well, the, the question we are asking is whether the time separation you would need to probe uh, all the way to, say, this cap region, or to probe the region where tidal effects invalidate the WKB approximation that we used in deriving our results, whether that time difference is large or small compared to the scrambling time. And what we find is that uh, most of the parameters in these expressions um, uh, are trying to make these ratios large, meaning that uh, you don't see anything of this internal structure until long after the scrambling time, which means after the OTOC has decayed, uh, again, via quasi-normal mode uh, decay. Um, yeah, I think I must have misunderstood then. So what you're saying is precisely that you cannot distinguish the microstructure using that. Or TLC. I thought it yes. went the other way around. Um, right, unless you okay. make this left moving temperature uh, huge. Um, so if you make this huge, um, and I'm not aware of a limit there is to choosing this parameter in the superstrata, um, then you could arrange that uh, 
you do have of access, but okay, not knowing too much about the superstrata constructions, I'm not sure if that's natural or it would be it would be completely contrived. Right, right. Can, can I just ask how far with, when when you stop scrambling, how far down the throat do you has the probe got approximately? It's, you said it stays away from this large tidal region, but how far to see the scrambling has it got? Uh, yeah, okay. I don't know the formula by heart in terms of the radii. Like uh, we converted the the radial position in terms of uh, the time difference uh, you need. I don't know if one of my collaborators might uh, be able to help out or if I'll have to keep this for later. It certainly looks like a large time um, to the cap in comparison. That, that, that's right. It doesn't look like no. it's around the corner from the, no, no. From the expression. And in fact, so, uh, and in fact the work we do with a graduate student tells us we can actually move the tidal region quite close to the cap by tuning multipole moments. So it's quite possible that tidal region is fairly close to the cap in a generic state. So interesting. So, so the, uh, can, can I ahead, sorry, yes, yes, Naish, Naish, go ahead. Nick, yeah, I, I didn't want to interrupt you. I think you were, you were going to finish your sentence. Oh, no, that's good. No, no, I'm supposed to be yeah. all right. Go for it. That's okay. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I wonder why you're surprised by this, because, um, I mean, it kind of makes sense that the microstructure, just from mechanistic uh -huh. talking, should be within a plank length of the horizon. Yeah. Uh, so that means that you should go basically all the way to within a plank length of the horizon and come back to uh, to actually probe the microstructure, at least the typical microstructures. And uh, so that basically means that you shouldn't see any deviation from GR until the scrambling time, because the scrambling time, as, as I said, uh, should, we have shown with my student, Christian Saraswat, is the same as the echo time, which means that you should just reach within a plank length and come back. And, and that's when, uh, that's the echo time and that's the scrambling time. That's how long it takes for you to probe the microstructure. Before that, there is no causal, basically a contact with the microstructure. You cannot distinguish GR uh, from, from microstructure. I, so I, I, think think, small, so, yeah. I think there's more collective modes involved. So when you have a superstratum, one of the messages is that the scram, well, mm. the scrambling. I think we got two motions of scrambling that I'm trying to settle on here. Well, there's, the, there's the one mm. that Ben, ben, uh, ben was, and was computing. But then there's the mm -hmm. scrambling that I tend to think of as what Emil and I found. And that, mm -hmm. that happens earlier on. And it's, it's a response from driving over, or we'll take ultra relativistic speeds over multipole moments, which extend, I think, further out. Now, you might, it might be that there's some limit in which that becomes Planck scale, but I, I don't think so. I mm -hmm. think it's, it really is significantly further out. And it's, it's because there's a tiny deviation from the vacuum state at the horizon created by the multipoles. And you hit them at high speed, and that's what causes the let me call it stringy excitations, which I tend to think of scrambling. So mm -hmm. I don't think this 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 limit of saying it's right at the Planck scale. I think it could be significantly and parametrically further away. But you know, we're all talking you know, uh, scale of mm -hmm. extra dimensions, so it's definitely particle physics scales. Mm -hmm. It may not be as much as Planck scale. Sorry. No, fair Sorry. enough. That's fair enough. Okay. Uh, um, uh, but the reason why I was asking Ben the question was he's he's finding the otox are doing something that looked like the sort of end of scrambling as a result of just the BTZ throat and exploiting the BTZ throat, which is even before the tidal forces cut in. So maybe I'm misusing mm -hmm. the term scrambling. It's a different thing. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, I, I agree that um, at least the OTOC doesn't seem to... Um, okay, it's, it's, it's the, the Lyapunov growth, uh, or the analog in this case, which is power law, does not seem to persist uh, long enough um, to be able to reach deep in deep in, in the throat. Um, that's right. what seems to come out. Um, so the question is: Is this physics we're seeing, or is it a patho pathology or bizarreness of zero temperature? That's, I guess, the other. Maybe, I, maybe I could ask: Is there something bizarre? about taking this uh, left moving temperature huge or is that an equally good uh, micro status as any other? Um... It is in principle equally good. I can tell you roughly what it looks like because we looked at it a bit. Um, so as you crank up at the quantum number, um, the QP 
is b squared n. b squared, b is a Fourier coefficient, n is the n you want. So, so b root n or root n is sort of the ratio of qp compared to, to, um, to q, proper power of q1, q5. And if you take n to be very, very large, what it means is you've got a rather small Fourier mode that's sort of dry in, in the zero, zero direction. And you have an incredibly spiked um, a, a sort of bump function. So I think it's it's sort of it's a strange limit to take because you you have to dial down the Fourier mode and dial up the end to keep, to keep QP constant and keep the same geometry. So I, I think it's a it's it's putting the the thing I call that 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 um, I call it the sort of mi the, the sort of micro microstate geometry wave the momentum wave that causes the transition. It's now becoming very spiked. It might be a very interesting limit to take. This is a slightly strange limit because it's actually dropping the Fourier coefficient quite small. Um, can, can I? Uh, yeah, um, I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. I, no, I'm sorry. Sorry. Do. Um, yeah. I, I just want to um, relay some intuitions about the non extremal case where you try to do these OTOC calculations in standard black hole geometries. Uh, naively, if you study, let's say, S-wave scattering, so uh, things that are uniform on the horizon of the black hole, and just naively try to interpret where the shock waves are in relation to the horizon, the, it's true that in three plus one dimensions, at the scrambling time, the shock wave is one Planck length away from the horizon. But in higher dimensions, it's parametrically smaller than a Planck length. Uh, it grows by powers of uh, ADS to, to L Planck. I mean, so it's parametrically smaller than the Planck thing. It's log entropy. It's not log of uh, uh, short shield radius over um, L Planck. And that numerical coefficient can be extraordinarily large. And so, what that means is it's an S-wave probe, so it might average over microstructure. But the question is, is there some way that you can discriminate, especially in higher dimensional things? I, I guess what is, I mean, real, you know, I understand that none of us understand what microstructure would look like in a non-extremal black hole. But if it's parametrically bigger than the Planck length, you might even guess in an average quantity it would show up in these higher dimensional calculations, especially. And so, uh, I mean, you know, we're hobbled by not having a model, but I mean, is there some toy that people have in the back of their minds for what you should do to, to make a, you know, a caricature of a non-extremal black hole? What should you put on the horizon? Some wiggly wave of Planckian extent or what, what uh, you know, I mean, you could then try if you put a little wiggly wave on the horizon with random that's random you know what do you uh you can sort of you, you know it, it seems possible that you might see something uh, the the so yeah it, it looks like samir has an idea oh okay let, let, let me defer to samir so go for it samir. you know i just have a small comment to what steve was just asking I do have a toy model I use at the back of my mind for the yeah. Rothschild case, but it is just a toy model. But there's an interesting small little calculation that uh, sort of supports the idea to whatever extent you can call this support being so rough. So if you imagine that you have, just like we see in the structure of the extremal and near extremal cases, Kaluza Klein monopoles and anti-monopoles like uh, placed next to each other. So everything is Planck scale because size of a Kaluza Klein monopole is Planck scale if the compact dimension is Planck scale. And so each of these units that I'm placing there, uh, basically the topological units uh, which I'm placing have an energy in which in the rest frame is like one Planck unit. And then you ask how far from the horizon you need, far, how far outside the horizon, a distance delta S, let's say proper distance, you need to place these. So the total energy of all the bits, these little pieces I'm putting, close the client monopoles and anti-monopoles, taking advantage of the redshift, because also have to redshift at that place, right? Should equal the mass M as seen from infinity. And you yeah. find it's always a Planck length in all dimensions. So that's very important, right? right? 
it's not less than applied. So what happens is the area, so the number of bits you need increases with dimension because the area goes like R to the power D right. minus one. But the redshift also goes in a certain way. So my picture is that, so the whole point of first ball was that all that happens, the compact dimensions are no longer trivially tensor to the non-compact in the interior. And that's what resolves everything. So you try right. to make the models of the uh, non-tensoring by taking monopoles and anti-monopoles. They all have a, a intrinsic energy in the rest frame of one Planck unit and then placing them of the order of one Planck length out to the horizon restores the total mass as seen from infinity to be M and the entropy to be correct and the energy to be correct. So it's just a toy calculation of estimates, but, but the fact and, is and, always... And the, and the typical one would kind of like have behavior that differs sort of randomly from cell to cell. That's right. You could just imagine that the each closer client monopole, you know, it, cap, it has Fermi zero modes on it. So it has four states on it from the Fermi on zero mode. So that gives you the entropy. Let's just put that. Each one has, is like a bit of... Okay. So, so you could imagine some kind of random wave whose magnitude is Planck, you know, rippling the horizon. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. You, it seems to me like you could try to scatter a shock wave off of that. And, you know, you'd, if it was an S wave shock wave, you'd see some average profile that would go like one over the square root of the entropy. So, no, you know, that let might, me see if I, you're trying to throw something in a scatter off it. Is that what you're talking about now? Yeah, that's what, that's how you compute an OTOC. You send in, you send in a shock wave very close to the horizon and then, shot, and then scatter another shock wave off. Okay, but then I, there's something relevant there which uh, I would like to mention. So what happens is that suppose you throw on it a shock wave whose wavelength is larger than the radius of the horizon. So that's very low, low long wavelength, low energy, right? Then yeah. you could do that. That's the kind of thing that Niyash was been thinking about recently, long wavelength. But let's not do that. Suppose you take something whose wavelength is shorter than the horizon, then the energy is bigger than P. And what you find in that case is that the energy of the incoming guy it, it gets converted to fuzz balls at a distance from the horizon, which is more than a Planck length. Because you know, send a shell in. If you send a shell in an S-wave shell, you have to ask at what point the new horizon forms where the total mass is M plus the delta M of the shell. And so what the way a fuzz ball reacts to infalling matter when the energy of what is being sent in is bigger than P is that you create new degrees of freedom from the vacuum outside the fuzz ball, not by hitting the fuzz ball and grinding around with what was already there. So uh, that's relevant. It's not like you hit the surface and then you know squish around it and learn something from there. Well, okay, that that's out of control for me, so that I can't say anything about that. Yeah, okay, but I was just saying there's an elementary oh. estimate. You can always compute how much energy will put the new horizon where, right? So fuzzball dynamics happens at the new oh. horizon. So if you throw some energy in, you know the new horizon will be outside the earlier surface, right? So it'll be. Uh, what is what I'm saying? If E is bigger than P, you'll be more than a Planck length outside the original horizon. Um, yeah, you don't. Have, you can put in very low energy probes in particular in this shockwave thing. I mean, then you can. You know, they, yeah. yeah. So it might be that you can. I mean, then you can. Yeah. Yeah. So and then you know and and the the thing is that scrambling is a very sharp probe in some naive sense of the horizon. I mean, the, the scrambling time, it's not, it's, you know, there's some way that it's an average sub Planckian distance in higher dimensions. And so, you know, it, it, it's, well, you know, I, I, one would have to think about it, but it would be interesting to take a toy model of the kind you're suggesting and, you know, just see what you need to uh, get things. But you can, I mean, the, you don't have to change the, the mass of the black hole by very much, by you know, substantially less than one Hawking quanta worth of energy. In, in what sense can you reliably say you're probing some planking distances from the horizon in an effective field theory? Because it's an S wave. And so you know, it's one of these things like an averaged, it's not like you've localized things in every dimension. You know, you, you uh, you can and you can compute the string corrections to this process. It's like doing a string scattering. The, the point is that the, the impact correct, you can study string scattering uh, and you know at high energies much higher than string scale, um, as long as the impact parameter is large. It's only when all the scales, like the impact parameter, are stringy that you know the you start exciting lots of string. And this is like in this, you're in this so-called Reggie limit where the impact parameter is very large. And so it's soft string scattering. And so you can compute that the, you, you, you know, a test of that is to compute the string corrections 
to uh, you know to the screen to the Lyapunov expert. And the string corrections I'm, I'm go confused, like L string. But, but, yeah. But you're but you're claiming some radial resolution at sub Planckian yes. level. Well, yes. How? Well, I mean, the idea is you 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 look at GR where you can resolve everything. And then you can compute the string corrections to that. And so it's it's not, you know, you can't just naively say, oh, if some dimensions are so you know, very small that it goes out of control. The test of whether it's out of control was whether the stringy corrections start getting big or not. And in this in this Regi limit, you can scatter things, you know, at very large center of mass energy because the impact parameter is very large. The, the crucial thing is the is the you know is the is both S and T Mandelstam variables. And S can be big if T is very small. You know, the ratio where S and T are fixed, you know, the fixed angle scattering, then your intuition is, is, is quite right. Uh, but in this limit of S big, but T, you know, much smaller than S, that's the Regi limit. You can go to high energies. And that's the limit that's scrambling. It's that Regi limit that the, that the OTOC probes. And so the question is, you know, does the, I mean, and, and that, because it's, it's in that limit and the impact parameter is large, you're sort of averaging over a lot of microstructure. And so the question is whether that averaging can smooth out the fuzzball structure and make it invisible uh, in this particular probe. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, but, but uh, it, it just turns out that, that you're very close to the horizon in this radial set. So uh, I don't know if, you know, I, I, it sounds to me like there's all kinds of room for, you know, out of control things in, the, in this fuzzball picture to, to happen. But it, it, it struck me that, that, you know, this is a knob that you have in, in sort of simple black hole pictures that, that might be useful. I was wanting to, uh, there were a couple of questions, but Samir, I, I think it got left hanging. What would happen if you probe with something that has less energy or same energy as Hawking quanta? Did you so, want to respond to that? Yeah, so uh, there are two different things. Right? Firstly, the wavelength will automatically be longer than the black hole radius. That's fine. Mm -hmm. And also you don't want to put a coherent wave in that because that's again too much energy. Then again, you'll form the horizon outside. So you mean, one quanta of this is this is one quant this is one yeah. quanta, and then it's definitely one... it'll, it'll definitely feel the surface and how it uh, reacts reflects will depend on what the surface is doing. That is, if you are looking at the extremal hole. Now, what Niyash found was that if you have a Schwarzschild kind of hole, then the Hawking radiation quanta outside the horizon, they will actually scatter you before you ever get within the Planck length of the horizon. So. And the IH point was that if you have electron positron pairs, and he's here, so he can probably save this better. But from what I understand, there'll be electron positron pairs hanging out outside the horizon from the, you know, at, at the distance from the horizon where E plus E minus pairs are relativistic. And now they are real particles because it's coming from a surface like a first ball and not from the vacuum like in the Hawking picture. And they form a plasma. And what they showed very nicely was a low energy wave will scatter in a specular fashion from there and go right back. So then it's those kind of things you have to worry about. It's rather difficult to probe the first ball itself because if this plasma is hanging out at a distance of you know one GV or whatever from the horizon, then uh, that's the one that is going to reflect you. Maybe Niyash is, is, that, is, that, is that, that, that different? Is that different than the naive Schwarzschild calculation of the hot talking right. gas? Right, because the Schwarzschild, you really have a vacuum at the horizon. So if something is coming in, it doesn't touch anything, right? It goes in without scattering. But if it's a surface at Planck length, which is hot, which is radiating the same temperature to infinity, then you actually have real E plus E minus pairs uh, at some distance from the horizon. The same kind of argument the firewall people are also using. Okay? You have real particles if you have a real surface there. And if you have a vacuum, then there's nothing there. So with the short shell picture, the particle realized become actual particles only three kilometers from the horizon. But with a fuzzball or any surface you put there, they are real particles from the beginning. And then you scatter off them. That sounds that sounds like it might be detectable in such a thing. I I, I it's down by G string or something, but well, I, exactly I, that's the IH point. Niyash actually showed in this recent paper, and I, I'm sure he's there, so he'll say something about it. <laughs> that if you have a long wavelength wave, it's actually going to reflect mm -hmm. in a specular fashion. That's also important because if it scatters in all directions, they're not going to see anything back. But mm -hmm. this plasma is going to reflect you back 
90, like 180, like come back to the same direction. And then you can see this. So Niaj, you're here, want to maybe mention something about yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, no, just, I, just I think one, it's, it's, hold it's a second, that... one second, one second, one second. Go ahead. Niaj, respond, uh, respond to the discussion. I know you've had a question, sure. but Andrea has been waiting for a long time. So Andrea, sure. Niaj, can you respond well, you to for me as well? Yeah, Niaj, go ahead. Uh, sure. Yeah. So I think the point Samir is making, and I think one uh, that I think it, uh, maybe a different way of thinking about it is often we are thinking about like a probe, like a point particle falling in. But if you're thinking about coherent scattering, especially short, uh, long wavelengths or low energy uh, waves, then uh, then you have coherent scattering process. And this calculation that, um, that we did was, uh, and most of the calculations for Hawking is really free, free quantum field theory. But, but the idea really is that you don't, at the end of the day, you don't have free quantum field theory, you have interactions and they break, they broke, uh, they break conformal symmetries. Um, so, uh, so horizon in GR is just gonna be free. Things can go through as, as if everything is conformal because it's conformally flat. But physics is not conformal. And in particular, I mean, the simple example we looked at is QED, which is not conformal, so because there's electron mass. And what happens is then uh, we showed, and we did it, and actually do it in both in Minkowski space and in uh, intra shape coordinates, which is kind of interesting. There are different ways of doing this calculation. Yeah, it, if you're uh, thinking in short shape coordinates, there is this Hawking plasma that turns on near the horizon. And then as the photons approach it, they see this plasma basically like a mirror and then they get partially reflected. The high frequency things go through, but the low frequency things see this plasma and then get reflected. And not this all is, of them this, get reflected, some fraction of them. This is, this is assuming right. a ball geometry or just GR? This is, this is assuming this what is, kind of black hole? So this is GR, but with the Hawking plasma. And I mean, the idea is that the fuzzball basically does the same far enough, I mean, much farther than a Planck length away from the horizon, does the same thing that GR does. That there's a Hawking plasma, uh, which is uh, just due to radiation. I mean, there's Hawking radiation going out, but then there would be Hawking electron positrons uh, within within a Compton. Uh, if the uh, distance to the horizon becomes the Compton wavelength of the electron, then you have this Hawking plasma that sits there. Well, it'll be interesting and, to and try I, to do yeah. an OTOC calculation there that's sensitive and see whether or not it, it uh, is influenced by that plasma. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, well, I, I can't think it through offhand, but, uh, mm -hmm. it, the probe is, mm -hmm. it's much more sensitive than a quasi normal mode probe. That's out of short shield radius. It's, it's mm -hmm. the virtue right, of it right. is it's, it's much closer to the horizon than that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, right. so that, that, it, that's, that's, what's good about it. Uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. and that's kind of why it's universal. It's because locally in GR, all horizons look the same, all the non-extremal horizons. So, so yeah, it's, yeah, that's yeah, right. I mean, it's a, it's a good test. So, uh, okay, that's, so, I, I have I another want, point. I Okay. okay, go ahead. Go I, ahead. I don't so want to belabor this. So I just wanted to raise this. And well. actually, I, I had another point, but I think Andrea had. Uh, yeah. had let's let's, let's let Andrea first. have so a maybe go. Maybe Andrea and should go. Yeah. We'll come back to you. Okay. Andrea, go it's ahead. A, in relation to this discussion, but less about having information come back out uh, than about probing the, the structures there. So uh, when you want to put like a wiggly wave on the, the horizon, you, you kind of input what kind of scale. Uh, structure the horizon would have to be right. So maybe a better right. model is to start with some structure that is there, like some bubbling solution that would be, you know, an actual solution, but is a toy model to perhaps more uh, generic situations. And so we had this tunneling calculation where we started with some microstate that had a certain number of uh, of uh, topologically non trivial cycles and and threw in uh, probes that are of the same type of uh, which the geometry is made of. Like say, it's take a solution that consists of M two brains and you throw in another M2 brain. And so in this tunneling calculation, what we found is that there's enhancement of this process when uh, the number of topologically non trivial cycles is very large. And that means then that they are very small. So this is maybe this fits with um, maybe the, the idea that uh, structure at the horizon is confined to like the Planck length away from the horizon or in that region and, and not much, much bigger. And, and here you, you, you don't have to put in the scales that you think are in the problem, but but they are there and they seem to indicate you that it wants to go um, from, so, so you compute the tunneling coefficient and you see that you get enhancement if, the, if there's a lot of uh, small bubbles in the but does that mean, Does that mean it's, it's, it's just incorrect to, to focus on one solution because there are effectively is a big transition 
rate to channel to something else? Yeah, you know, if you start channel. with an atypical solution and you throw something in, it becomes more and more typical. And so there's two things. So one is the what uh, captures the entropy. And so there's, there might be some indications that a um, few bubbles, like this uh, super strata solutions, where you have a few centers, two centers, um, capture more entropy. But you, then we have this tunneling count calculation, which says that dynamically, uh, a solution with many bubbles is preferred. And so that would yeah, okay. go in the direction that you have, like maybe blind scale structure, the scale of the horizon, instead of something you know, very big extending far out. But you don't, you can't just pick one typical uh, blank scale structure because all, all they mix well, with all the others. They always mix, yes, yes, yes. I think they mix, yeah. One, one I mean, is, that, is that right? Is that the, is that the fantasy that, or the picture that, that all the, <laughs> all these different geometries? Fantasy That's is a good fantasy. thing. I, I, it's, I it's, a good, it's, a good, it's a good word. But, yeah, but I, I think, mean, the, I think have, once you heat, yeah. we're very conscious of the fact that once you heat it up a bit, then there's going to be lots and lots of transitions between all of these things, and so even before yeah, it's even going. before. Okay, but yeah. um, let me see. Yeah, I'm trying okay. to be traffic cop, and uh, Julian's <laughs> also been. Uh, did you get answer your question, Andrea? First, before we. It was more of a comment, but yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. So Julian, you were next. Well, I was, but what I'm going to say is maybe going in a bit slightly different direction. So I think Nayash also had, okay. had a question, Nayash, which is yeah. maybe still on topic, but I would still like to raise my point. Yeah, absolutely. So well, well, maybe it is more efficient to let in, Nayash. In the Nayash, go ahead. Right. Okay, so, so I, I just wanted to say something in relation to this discussion and actually uh, the points that Nick uh, was making regarding echoes, which uh, so the, 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 the picture that uh, Nick was talking about was this, like a string falling through and then kind of getting stuck near the, uh, near the cap. Um, I think that's, that's certainly one way to think about echoes, uh, but uh, the, maybe a better picture this is the one that I've been advocating uh, more recently has been that maybe we shouldn't think about it as things, uh, particles falling in, but rather coherent uh, scattering. And in particular, um, instead of this geometric picture, one can think about uh, a stimulating Hawking radiation. So that's what I was uh, suggesting. So if, if you imagine a fuzzball or whatever your microstructure is, if it's at finite temperature, Hawking radiation is basically the spontaneous decay or spontaneous emission of basically this, uh, this excited state. So you basically emit Hawking photons one by one and then gonna de-excite from one state to another. Um, now, uh, one can think about a stimulating Hawking radiation and that, in fact, that also ties into the tidal uh, uh, story that we've been thinking about is that you can stimulate in principle Hawking radiation because Hawking radiation after all is just simple atomic uh, transition if your atoms are your fastballs or your micro states. So how can you stimulate this? I mean, principle, uh, as we learn in physics, I mean, Einstein did this, is uh, if you have a, a background of radiation at the same frequency as a transition, uh, you could uh, stimulate the transition. Uh, and that background could be provided by uh, some incoming quanta, uh, a, a macroscopic number of them. So it could be low frequency, but a large occupation number. And uh, you could also think of it as just uh, a, a time-dependent tidal force uh, on your fuzzball or whatever your structure is. And then that should, uh, if it's a finite temperature structure, that should uh, stimulate uh, the Hawking radiation. And that, that would be the way that you could think about probing uh, this uh, a structure near the fuzzball at low frequencies rather than at high frequencies. Okay, so anyway, so that was what the, the picture I wanted to advocate whether we could do calculations maybe in that regime, uh, yeah, basically, instead quick, of, yeah, go ahead. Can make a quick comment. Um, the calculation, maybe Elmo can answer this off the cuff, but one of the things we found is that it, the input energy of the particle determines the cutoff, a cutoff at the, of the mode number excitation of the string that goes in. So a suitably soft quanta won't excite a string mode. And I'm try, I, but I can't off the, cuff, off the cuff say what a suitably soft quanta is. But we, we in the paper, we talked about a K max, which was determined by the redshift factor and the th energy you throw in. And so uh -huh. a suitably soft quanta will probably not be subject to this. So this is and what I was, as were, people were talking, I was thinking, my God, you know, is, is what Samir and Steve talking about the same as taking the kind of scattering calculation that Emil and I did, but with what I mean by the suitably soft quanta that won't realize it's a string before it hits the bottom. 
But do you have a mm -hmm. panel? Do you have a thought on what that K max is? Uh, that's too far back in history for me to remember. <laughs> Yeah, you're suffering the same thing. But, the, but, the, but in principle, but, but the yes, the, you know, the the point the point's well taken that that if you sort of drop a probe from low enough down the throat, uh, it doesn't blue shift enough for the effect we described to kick in. Yeah. So also, you know, perturbative talk, quanta that sit in the cap should be relatively unaffected by those phenomena. So so the, the, also if you just drop a really soft quantum from from high up it should also do the same thing uh, you know when i was asked about this question about our microstate geometries and you know how do i know that they exist well they're very delicately tuned and if you drop a nuclear weapon on them they get destroyed but if you drop soft quanta you can ping them and that's the same thing i think mm -hmm. if you and i, but I think i think it's more I, dropping a soft quantum is what's trying to wiggle the tail of of uh, exactly. a wave function that's concentrated yes. way down in the cap. Right, exactly. So I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. I want to go back and do that. But I think, Julie, did we have any yes, further yes, follow-ups? Yes, Are there any follow-ups on this conversation or should we have a... Okay, Julie, go ahead. I, I mean, I, I think, I, I, sorry, I'm the follow-up just, just one said that there's a softness of the quantum and then the occupation number. And I'm just what I'm saying is that there are really two dimensions to this question. One is if you have a low frequency or soft quantum, the other is how many of them you have uh, yeah. in on the same estate. And yeah, so just wanted to make that um, point. Yeah, I th I th we didn't look at coherent scattering. We just simply looked at mm -hmm. ping it with a ping it with a particle. So mm -hmm. okay. point well made, but Thanks. I'm not sure I can answer it. Okay, um, <laughs> Julian. So um, basically, uh, also picking up a little bit from from my talk. Um, but uh, th th it seems to be a, one of the interests is to distinguish again between microstructure and and let's say the you know the, the thermal result of the ensemble. And what I wanted to ask out there is that yes, if you look at these probes, some of which I mentioned, like uh, spectral statistics, basically that are probes at much smaller energy differences or at much later times, then I mean there seems to be a mounting consensus that now we we can actually use. Uh, semi-classics to predict what that should be. And what it should be is actually the, you know, that the relation, the expectation that you have from quantum chaotic systems and random matrix theory, namely that there should be level repulsion. And I wonder whether something like this can be calculated also in this possible program and whether uh, what is the answer that you get expect or whether there are already results. So can you calculate, for example, something like spectral statistics or even just moments of the spectral statistics uh, using okay. the geometries I, that you have? I, I, so I can give a quick response. At the moment, this is high on the list of to do. And, but at the moment, what we've done so far is largely linear perturbation theory about given geometries, at which point we don't see that kind of spectral statistics. Um, however, I'm hoping that based on the work we've been doing recently, we can start looking at nonlinear uh, interactions, um, second, third, fourth order perturbation theory around very restricted classes of these geometries. And then maybe we'll see some, well, we already see frequency shifts in spectrum response to amplitudes. So I'm hopeful we can see something by making a suitably simplified model. In particular, one of the things that's very high on my to-do list based on this conference is that, you know, I used a bunch of tricks to get down to functions of one variable. I can use a bunch of tricks to get, to reduce the superstratum problem down to something that looks a little bit like an extension of super JT gravity. And so maybe there's a way to link the kinds of interactions that live in JT gravity to the kinds of interactions that live inside a superstratum. It's a, it's a big ask, but, but it might be conceivable. So the short answer is we don't have any direct results about eigenvalue repulsion or, or not. But if you find something that doesn't have eigenvalue repulsion, what would you conclude? that we hadn't done our job right, perhaps, I don't know. But, I, but more seriously, um, the superstrata contain as a trivial truncation super JT. So it's gotta have some of that sort of stuff somewhere. And that's really what I'm hoping we will find. But uh, does that, somebody else would probably want to say something about this. Um, Joseph or Andrews, you've still got your hand up. I don't know whether you wanted to say that. I'm just looking at hands. Yeah, it's a, a, a question to Julian actually on this. Okay, For, go ahead. To, to answer this question, one would need a large number of, like what kind of fraction of the entropy of states one needs to have. Yes, and it would well, that's part of what I'm right? asking, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, 
But, uh, but I think that's why I said that perhaps truncating the superstratum down to something that looks a bit like super JT, you might have enough control or enough connections between the two systems to see uh, those states. And this is why I was asking, you know, how many, how, you know, how many, how many states do I need? Is 10 good enough? And I, you know. but Nick, Nick, can I ask a yeah. question about that? Sure. We, we know that JT is an ensemble theory yeah. or super JT, uh, maybe mm -hmm. depending on how much super symmetry. Uh, you don't expect, I mean, I thought the whole point of the, of the you know, the uh, I can microstate geometry program uh, oh. is to not have an ensemble theory. So, so are you are you anticipating that doing some kind of uh, truncation is equivalent to doing some ensemble averaging? No, Why no, do you think they should be connected? Well, what I'm okay. What I'm hoping or what I'm thinking is that um, that if I identify that you know we've got this massively complicated theory with lots and lots of excitations, uh -huh. and I was hoping to see if I identified the knobs inside this very complicated system, but that somehow connected to JT gravity. I might- Oh, I, I, I know, I see. You, what you expect, I think what you, what you want is some kind of end of the world brain in JT gravity, a yes. boundary condition at the end Indeed. of, uh, at the end of, that's what you're looking for. The cap, for. yes. Yeah. Problem and, is and, and, and in particular, in particular, get some insight into why the analytic continuation of JT give count states and something I'm familiar with. That's the sort of the game. Sorry, so is the, is the idea that somehow the microstates that you're looking for are like end of the way, world brain states in, in, in JT? Yeah, yeah, that, I, now I, that, that's, that's what you're trying to do. Maybe trying I didn't understand. An effective, description, an effective description of these uh, fuzzball geometries as, uh, as some end of the world brains in JT. Yes. That, that's yes. a good idea. No, but something else, the, the problem is that JT by itself, it cannot actually have, have a cap. It cannot actually, so, you know, if you just look at the JT, right, right. you don't have exactly. enough to synthetic yeah. ideas too, you need, you need to do something. And, you know, essentially we know that microstate geometries, you put something in the infrared, there's a natural way to have an ADS2 in the UV and then to have an infrared which just terminates. And to have excitation. Yeah, that, that, that's, freedom, I think in the game, that's called an end of the world brain. Yes. That, that, that's the knob, I, the primary thing I want to find out is can I put that knob into JT to give you the ability to end it somewhere in a cap? Yeah, that, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, uh -huh. a very interesting thing to try to do. Um, but there's a question uh, actually if you average, I mean, if you. Hang on, let, 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 let Steve finish right. his thought and then, then jump in. Yeah, I, I now, I mean, the, the simplest kinds of end of the world brains we know how to construct, just you know, adding simple things to JT, typically uh, do not stay outside the horizon. You yes, know, they fall into the horizon. So you well, want something that stays out of the horizon. Well, that's what we build, Steve. That's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it would be interesting to, to see. Now, I think in JT, you typically will want something that's uh, not quite extremal. And no, 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 so, no, 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 no. That's fair comment, fair comment. Symmetric. Extremal okay. and supersymmetric. No, no, no. Extremal and supersymmetric. No, okay. no. We, but we want in JT the kinds of situations we're interested in are where you have a little bit of temperature, where temperature. you're above the and gap. I think that's something we might be able to do. Now, let me just. Um, Andrea was next, and then Samir. So, Andrea, did you want to yeah. ju jump in? Um, yeah, maybe a quick comment on this, and then I have a question for Julian. So. Um, if uh, so, okay. If you believe that the anti-brain back reaction does not completely destroy a flux uh, background, then uh, I think we might have indications that if you place uh, so so we have in this tunneling calculation we found that you you know we we have this non um, we have this metastable minima that you can tunnel and um, it seems that uh, the back. So if anti-brain back reaction doesn't kill the throat, then you might be able to get a non-extremal. Uh, solution that's not too different, so a near extreme solution that's not too different from the extremal one. So maybe in the context of uh, you know heating something up in JT gravity, um, yeah, there might be something to do. But actually, I, I had a question for Julia about. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned these um, sums over periodic orbits, and you were quite quick on that part. And I wanted to know whether this is a different story from um, what Steve and Phil and and Douglas uh, were talking about, or. No, so I mean, the point is that I mean, I don't have a concrete story to tell here. So, Steve, I think Steve has, a, um, well, one could use these words to describe what Steve and, 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 and collaborators have done. But what I wanted to just point out was that the idea somehow, so, so this, this uh, you know, one of the 
weird things that has come out recently is that somehow this uh, semi-classical effective theory knows something about really the, 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 the geometry of, not the geometry, the distribution of the microstates, like very microscopic information. And we've all been saying, I think rightly so, that this seems like, the, you know, it's smarter than we thought it should be. But there is this context in which basically in quantum chaotic theories, the semi-classical expansion is smarter than it has any right to be. That somehow this extremely fine gain structure of, 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 of systems, quantum systems that are classically chaotic, you can say something extremely fine-grained about their, their energy level uh, distribution. And the theory with which this is realized is what is, what is known since, you know, Goodsviller and Barry, and I guess maybe even earlier, is known as periodic orbit theory. And so in that sense, that makes it a little less miraculous. Okay, that was my comment. But of course, um, in terms of concrete realizations, I think um, what Stephen, that's why I also referred to his talk, have done is the, is the, is the, 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 the most concrete hint that we have that something like this could work, right? But of course, the goal would be to, to maybe say something like this in higher dimensions. Or um, Steve, right? I mean, you're doing the toy model of the toy model there, right? The toy model of SYK. So of course, going beyond uh, would be the, yeah, let's say the fantasy here. Steve, did you want to respond? No, I, I agree with that. I think I think this periodic orbit thing is a is a is a good metaphor that, that you know we use for quite a while to identify. And there's a way you can make quite a sharp correspondence with these random matrix uh, ideas that you know, in terms of like the Feynman graphs, if you don't put in the parent, the averaging kind of makes the geometry smooth. If you don't average, you have dangling legs on the Feynman diagram that give the noise. So, so there's a rather uh, precise link in the random matrix story. The, the challenge is whether or not there's an equivalent, the, the periodic orbit theory description is a little bit like the fuzzball description, that there is no, that there's no, in, as part of the fundamental rules, there's no wormhole. The wormholes are some kind of effective thing. It seems that there might be alternate descriptions like this collective field thing, where you can have an exact rewrite where the fundamental variables contain geometry. This is this is the and, and the, so the question is: Is there an alternate description where you actually have horizons, where you have wormholes, and then you add something else to it to fix it up? And you mean the half so, wormholes to fix that, or yeah, the half wormholes do that; they fix it up. They, or, they, they, you, as a part of the fundamental description, you have a, a wormhole. That's part of the rules, okay? You have a G left, right, but it still factorizes because of this other contribution. But is the half wormhole but, or the front No, but something, but something that we do know also from just the generic expectations from this chaotic story is that, you know, there's a diagonal part of the sum, which I showed. So you have these orbits basically, which really are classical orbits and they have some action S and you look at the sum over orbits. And by the way, what's interesting, just as a side comment, these A coefficients that I showed, what goes into these are actually classical notions of these uh, orbits. So things like the Lyapunov exponents and so on, but okay, they're just like a side comment. But the point is you have a diagonal part in which the phases exactly cancel. And that diagonal part is known since the days of Barry to give that linear ramp. So that gives you the, the linear rise. And we also know that this comes from the wormhole. So in some sense, we, there is a sum over the diagonal contributions, but we can replace that sum just with the wormhole. I think that that much we can probably say. Or would you disagree, Steve? Well, yes, I think that's that's the metaphor that, that I think the, the point is though is whether that in that kind of set of words, which I'm sympathetic to, uh, and you know, we, we've used it, is that is that the wormhole that is kind of effective. It's an effective description of the diagonal. Mm -hmm. The question is, is there a fundamental set of rules, like, you know, a fundamental set of equations in the bulk where the wormhole is part of the fundamental equations? I mean, in SYK language, is G left, right part of the rules? You know, is that the definition of the bulk? And, and, and that would be a set, of, a, a set of rules where you would have geometry. Well, and then you'd have to correct it to make factorization. I mean, as you know, I um, I quite like using this other set of variables, which is sort of, uh, I mean, it's just a different set of variables, but it's adopted, let's say, more to the late time physics. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's more- Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. So that but there it is part of the fundamental rules. 
Well, but, good. Yeah. So, so, but then you need to account for the noise. That's in correct. Your description. Yes. And, yes, and yes, you yes. Know, that, that's what we did in the SYK variables. If we found yes. the noise is some other part of the integration space. And you'll probably find something similar. Uh, you know, you'll find there's some other part of the sigma model that's not the small fluctuations that causes the noise. Um, that that just has to be the way it is. If it's an exact rewrite. Yeah, I agree. the The, the small comment was just that the the wormhole there really is one exact contribution. Well, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, okay, um, but but I mean the real challenge is this other thing. To account for the noise. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so listen patiently for some time. Unless yeah. and Andrea, if, if it's pertinent to this conversation, say it quickly and then we'll move on to Sonia. Yeah, I was going to ask whether the, the half wormholes are uh, more fundamental than the wormholes. And in light of the uh, letters, this paper by Bauer Mu, and I cannot spell it, pronounce his last name, but uh, he yeah. seems to have found the rise from half wormholes. Yeah, no, that, that I mean, I, I think that's right. If you look at the formulas, you find out. It, there's kind of this democracy of the kind that Eberhard, one of the interesting things in this Mohammed Janoff paper is that he pointed out a connection between uh, this toy toy, toy squared model and uh, this phenomenon that Eberhard found. Mm -hmm. That you don't have to sum over both. You can, if you take one saddle point and do all the quantum fluctuations around it, you get a result that gives the other saddle point. The expansion doesn't get smaller. Eventually you get a big piece. And that's, that's the kind of thing that Everhard found, where if you take in his, another toy model, the tensional string, if you take vacuum ADS and then sum up all the stringy corrections, you find something that looks like the black hole, this long string. So it might be that there's a democracy, but it's perfectly valid to take both saddle points. See, the, the, the thing that Everhard is, doesn't, isn't sure of is what's the rule? Do you sum over both or do you sum over one or the other? You know, there, there's a modular invariance that said you should just, you shouldn't, you know, you can sum over all of them, but you have to do something modular invariant. Um, do you arrive at the contradiction if you sum over both and include all the corrections to one? Or like yeah, you know, well, much, I, no? I, I, I actually, I, I'm not quite sure, but you, you have to make sure that you're not overcounting. You don't get an infinity from, from doing the full modular invariance and then summing over all the modular images. You know, it's a gauge symmetry. You have to mod out by it. Whereas, and in, and in the G Sigma story, you find something similar that, you know, you can, it's a question of whether you do the integral by steepest descents or whether you say, you know, look, I'm gonna find this place and I'm gonna do the expansion and I'm gonna sum it all up. It's just different ways of doing the integral. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and that's the, that, you know, that's kind of the very lowbrow fantasy of this equivalence of description. You have one integral and you can do it whichever way you want, you know, and different, <laughs> probes will probably be simplest in different ways of doing the integral. You know, if you do some averaging, then it's better to do it by steepest ascents because the half normal contribution goes away. If you want to prove factorization, maybe you should integrate out G left, right first, and then the thing obviously factorizes. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so it's, it's that sort of democracy that, that's, uh, you know, a hint. But I, I think... The question about whether it's fuzzballs or black holes with horizons may, you know, it might be uh, a choice, not not a, you know, a, a schism or whatever the right word is. I don't Met think it's a schism. Right. Okay, it's not oh, it's no. a chasm, but it's a, a what? what it, I don't think it's a chasm. I think it's just, you know, what context you're asking the questions in. I was using the word schism as in, as in religious. religious. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not that. Uh, <laughs> I want to give a hand over to Samir for, because for, he, he's been waiting patiently to ask. Yeah, I have to re leave in a few minutes. So I, I uh, okay. uh, I'll, I'll listen to Samir's comment, then I'm going to have to sign off. Okay. Yeah, just maybe a couple of small comments in response to what I was just hearing, and then maybe a question for. A couple of you. So first, I, I did want to emphasize, yes, exactly as Steve and Nick was saying, the end of the world brain in JT gravity is typically placed behind the horizon. But here the whole story is that once you have a horizon, uh, you can't save the information puzzle without non-locality. That's the small correction theorem. So really the point of the fuzzball is, as Steve was also saying, to place it outside the horizon. So about the schism thing, I think it is a schism because if you have a horizon, you have to be precise about what it means. And 
in the small correction theorem, we give it a precise meaning. And it means that up to some approximation for the production of up to one Hawking pair, that means in the region of order at least, you know, one or two Hawking pair, that much region, you have some approximation of low energy physics, let's say from one centimeter to three kilometers, in which you will see a pair being produced. Once you have that, you are not in the first ball. That's the opposite to the first ball. And now without non-locality, you can't fix the problem. So if there is no schism and there are two alternative descriptions, then the very non-local wormholes that connect you to infinity would have to be in this other description. So that was just my comment about the schism. So to me, they look quite uh, sharply different, but it would be great to see if you know, uh, you know, the non-local wormholes could, could do something. But the question I actually had for maybe uh, both Steve and Ben Krabs was, once you use this inside of the horizon in your pictures, like you have the full, let's say, eternal black hole diagram, then there's this old question, right? Just the way, let's say, Ben was drawing these uh, quanta inside the horizon. You could make quanta there, which have negative energy as seen from infinity, right? But in the CFT, we don't have negative energy excitations, at least not in any easy way. So are those negative energy excitations also in the CFT or they are not in the CFT? If you want to say something to your computation, I guess, or... Uh... I, I guess the, the region behind the horizon uh, is not quite necessary. You can do everything like on the right side, say, um, because these lines, it's true that they were drawn um, like across the past horizon, but um, but where you specify the boundary conditions is at say the right side at early and late times. And then you propagate backward and forward in time and the scattering happens outside the horizon. So I don't think it's crucial whether this picture continues uh, beyond that or not. Uh, okay. Because I was just wondering, I mean, I've always been uh, skeptical or maybe let's say puzzled about whether the inside of the horizon can really come out in something very simple. So I'm just trying to trace, trace out some a calculation which I can see a clear use of the region inside the horizon. But the mo moment I try to see some calculation where that can happen, I can always, always ask this question, right? If I just draw the line in the other uh, slope, but still inside the horizon, it has negative energy. So the positive energy ones had good representation of the CFT, the negative energy ones also do. Uh, and there could just be some very complicated operators in the CFT. Uh, it's not a new question. I mean, it's, it's a standard question, but I still don't know yeah. what's the... Standard answer. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave right now. So I, I, I'll leave, Ben, I'll let you uh, continue the discussion. Thanks a lot. Okay. I've enjoyed this conference. Uh, thanks, thanks for putting it on. Talk to you guys thanks, later. Thank you. Before you run out, just let, let me say thank you for, for oh, he's gone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just want to say thanks, but okay. We should probably wrap mm -hmm. this session up. Um, Samir, you still have your hand up, as does Andrew. Is there any last words you want to say? No, I just lowered it. Okay. Well, I guess I well, let me just share the screen and remind you of, uh, well, hopefully I've been having trouble sharing the screen for some time, but okay, let me try this again, um, of next year. And also to say thank you to everybody for participating and being part of this thing, particularly the speakers and panelists. It's been really very, very good. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. So it's been, it's been great. And one of the things I also want to stress is while there have been a lot of talks sort of focused on the microstate geometry and everything else um, discussion, I'm really grateful to the people who come from different aspects of the micro microstructure pro problem to come and talk to us and explain to us and try and put their perspective in, in, into and teach us about their perspective. That's been immensely valuable. So thank you to all the people from, you know, from Jeff Pennington and Steve and Julian and so forth and Joachim and you know, the, the, and of course, the usual suspects and everybody in between. It's been a really nice mix. And I think it's a very important part of the conference that we actually listen to each other and try and learn from each other. So thank you. And we'll call it a day there. Joseph, you can kill the recording. Yes, and we can... I will. And also, uh, thanks, Nick, a lot. I mean, Nick is the one who, I mean, you know, I'm officially also an organizer, but, you know, Nick is the one who put most of the sweat and blood in, in this. Yeah, uh, I was going to say it on behalf of speakers and panelists, since I, I'm, I'm officially allowed to, so, <laughs> as Joseph is trying to do so. Thanks to all the organizers. Uh, it's really fantastic. Appreciate it, Nick. Uh, I'm sure 